basically why I'm here is to um, uh, report kind of report back on that um, but also check in myself um, and and I it, it's been interesting to listen to the discussion as an outsider I come as a grammarian and as a former general contractor so I have tremendous credentials here to speak to you the, the specialists <laughs> but ultimately I wanted to find out what happened um, I think there's significant questions that are going on in terms of authorship um, and tremendous wisdom in Bugs Bunny in terms of going back, what was the, what was the left turn at Albuquerque that should have been taken potentially that, that might help us better understand how to get back to where we intended to be or, or some of the discussions that we've had. Um, just an overview of, of where, um, where I'll be going. Um, First of all, looking at what factors gave rise to the modern importance of, of authorship. From my standpoint, authorship has become important more recently uh, in terms of canon history. Um, who cares most about authorship? I mean, why is it a core value? Why is it so significant from a presuppositional standpoint? Which communities are interested in that? Um, the calculus that drove canonical decision-making in the early church um, and then how are we to understand earliest Christianity's diverse application of canonical criteria? That's been a, a theme of, uh, it seems like a mess. It's this Wild West food fight. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They don't, they're not used consistently. So how can we even know that they were criteria? Or are they something that they're being anachronistically read back in? Um, and then my, my uh, proposal would be how might uh, going retro help the modern church move forward. So beginning with uh, what factors gave rise to uh, the modern importance of authorship. Um, the answer to this question can be found by walking back the Hegelian dialectic a few stages. The intense modern interest in authorship that undergirds the current debates about pseudepigraphy is inextricably tied, in my opinion, to the core presuppositions introduced by 18th and 19th century historical critics. Um, their quest for, the script for scripture's original meaning and its Zitzimleben necessitated identifying the author along with the social, cultural, historical, and literary contexts that spawned the original version um, that was uh, what led, um, what what later became uh, re received canonical text. Up to this point, the church had largely been able to squelch this line of scholarship through its influence and authority. Dissenters were branded heretics and removed from their posts, uh, or forced into obscurity. And and basically, it was a it was a. Uh, uh, and for those that did want to hold their positions, they they kept those those ideas. Um, off to the side. Uh, but there was a tide that quickly turned in rapid, uh, with a rapid succession of influential publications that effectively popularized the critical inquiry and essentially robbed the church of its ability to, to keep these things quiet. Um, in the same year, Darwin's Origin of Species offered an evolutionary account of creation where Karl Marx's political economy offered an evolutionary account of societal development. Uh, so several years later, Adam Smith's Chaldean account of Genesis demonstrated that Israelite religion likely derived from other ancient Near Eastern cultures. And then in the 1875 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, the updated articles um, received critical uh, accounts of the origins of the Bible and uh, the, the, the biblical books. The church's unwillingness to previously engage such questions meant that it was completely unprepared to address these now popularized versions that parishioners were asking their vicars about. Um, this rapid succession of popular societal changes set the stage uh, for rationalist questions that had formerly been condemned as heresy to be reintroduced and incorporated within the discipline of theology. Professors who had once been tried for heresy were reinstated and scholars who had been marginalized were welcomed based on their expertise in addressing the issues raised by historical critical methodologies. I vividly remember the sickening feeling I had in 1994 reading Emil Kraling's, uh, I think it was the History of Old Testament Historical Criticism or Interpretation, uh, uh, his account of the church's decision to quell rather than actively engage enlightenment inquiries um, 
that led in a in 20 some years to the overthrow of orthodox influences in many institutions the current trajectory of thinking in north america from my opinion from my standpoint seems headed toward yet another lap around this well-worn track unless preventative steps um, can be taken and and we've heard stories uh, this weekend of the devastating impact of being blindsided by these issues um, as individuals. So although my paper is presented from a largely confessional point of view uh, with a focus on pastoral responses um, to the conference's topic, this should in no way be mistaken for a dismissal of the legitimate historical questions tackled by the papers delivered here and more broadly within our guild. So in terms of Hegelian development, the 19th century popularization of historical criticism that overwhelmed the church seems to be the most logical point to assign the, the sea change attached to the shift, uh, shift in focus to the authorship of New Testament books, and, and, or more a, a, a privileging of that in terms of canon and authority. Um, uh, but we would be remiss to not note the rise of fundamentalism uh, during this same period within Protestant circles in an effort to reassert and reestablish ecclesiastical, uh, ecclesiastic control over the engagement of these historical critical questions. So who cares most about um, authorship? And I would say there are basically two groups and they are strange bedfellows. Uh, first, the historical, the historians working within historical critical methodologies. Um, the Enlightenment response to pietist readings that ignored historical, social, cultural questions about the Bible and its origins were, are the, the main proponents. Um, and it's based on the understanding that the original meaning uh, in its Sitzimleben, or setting in life, presupposes knowing the author, intended audience, social setting, epistolary forms, and you can go on and fill in the blanks. Um, those who are work, um, the, the, the other, um, and I would say largely a response to the, the progressive or liberal historical critical scholars, um, you know, you can go into the, the rise of fundamentalism, uh, uh, coming out of Princeton and other areas to try to essentially engage the historical critics on historical issues. Um, so you see the rise of the historical grammatical literal interpretive framework. It's a method that arose in response to historical critical scholars' critiques about not attending enough to uh, contextual background. And so I think there's a need to have engaged these things, but my point here is to simply look at how these two, um, two groups have, have essentially evolved with, with similar goals and object, uh, objectives. And the emphasis on authorship stemmed from, uh, first of all, shifts in hermeneutical understanding of authorial intent, and then second, an intertwining of divine inspiration with apostolic authorship. Um, I'm not going to be able to have time to go there much, and we had some in initial discussion about that. It's more an observation rather than, than having a solution. Um, so the key takeaways. Um, both methodologies shifted attention away from the social and theological processes of canon, thank you, recognition, uh, rather than formation. I will try to change throughout this, but thank you. Uh, I, I will uh, see if I can maintain that, because I that very much isn't where I'm coming from. Um, so... Both of these both of these responses uh, shifted attention away from the social theological uh, canon recognition and and uh, with all its complexities toward historically defensible accounts of textual origins. Um, both groups, and and I think that's significant because all of a sudden we've you know that's the, where the metaphor of moving the goalpost has come that. That all of a sudden, as a result of these things, we've we've shifted our attention away from where I believe what we see the the early church and earliest Christianity doing. Um, so to illustrate, uh, in in one of the uh, I Howard Marshall in his ICC commentary in the Pastoral Epistles notes that um, you essentially have a priming effect from these two again. I'm not trying to lump, but prototypically we have the historical critics on the one hand and the, the fundamentalist, uh, the fundamental oriented historical, grammatical, and literal. Um, 
you, you will find both groups largely driven by their presuppositions, almost in, in terms of priming, um, where they have presuppositions and as they go and look at the same data, arrive at opposite conclusions that's largely in, in line and in keeping with um, their, their presuppositions. Martin Wright in his recent uh, publication, Breaking Down the Dividing Wall, uh, he says, uh, those sympathetic and those unsympathetic to the canon share the same assumption of its fragil fragility. Uh, he then goes on to compare, strangely enough, the reasoning of Bart Ehrman and Stanley Porter to demonstrate that presuppositions largely drive the conclusions that are reached. So the initial takeaway is that if you're waiting for a scholarly consensus, this is actually a, a, a some footage from a recent conference elsewhere uh, tackling, but, but if you're waiting for a consensus, I don't think we're going to see it come about. So the question we're is... We're going to do that as a team building. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring a change of clothes, please. This is, a, this is my best suit. Um, so the next question is, what calculus drove the canonical decision-making in the early church? Um, I've done my best to to heed. Uh, I woke up at three thirty this morning to, to be able to heed D Lee McDonald's admonition to read the rest of the story regarding uh, canonical criteria and what follows. So I purposefully chosen calculus because it's it's looking at maths and a pick, essentially picking strategies to best solve the problem. And I think that's what we see in the canon criteria. Um, And so I'll summarize them here in the following diagram, and I've, I've purposefully combined some categories um, for simplicity's sake, but also based on how the, the lens through which I'm seeing things. Scholars typically cite various criteria for canonical affirmation, apostolicity, use, catholicity, antiquity, and orthodoxy. So for sake of time and to draw attention to the practical significance of catholicity and use, I've combined them and, and rephrased them in terms of edif you know, edification. Were they valued? Was there a, a, a ministerial benefit that was derived from them by the church? Um, and again, for simplicity's sake, I have merged antiquity uh, with apostolicity um, in that if, if apostolicity is achieved, it essentially satisfies the criteria of antiquity. It's a, it's a two for one, you know, that if you can tie it to an author or tie it to a, a, an apostle, you get antiquity for free. Um, and I would also say that you also get a probably a maybe a, a lighter first pass initially before all of the pseudepigraphal writings came of, of orthodoxy in terms of it's associated with Paul in the same way I wore a bow tie partly out of respect for Steve Walton, but also because it grants me five minutes of respectability and then the rest is on me. Um, and, and I think associating a name allows potentially uh, credibility that would be much easier than starting with in, in one's own name. So there were a variety of different reasons for motivating um, pseudonymic, uh, or, yeah, pseudonymic references. So let's take a look at, at each of these in turn. Um, apostolic origins. Um, so again, combining uh, apostolicity with antiquity. Uh, Allen, Clark, McDonald, Moole, and many others make clear that apostolicity does not equate with apostolic authorship, but the failure to acknowledge this nuance is a likely cause for questioning the veracity of this criterion. McDonald's, McDonald describes the New Testament literature as reflecting the, quote, apostolic deposit of authoritative teaching that can be traced back to Jesus' apostles, even if... Uh, even if it's not believed to be pinned by them. Uh, so quoting from him, the church upheld the apostolic witness in its sacred literature as a way of grounding its faith in Jesus, represented by the apostles' teaching, enduring, uh, ensuring that the church's tradition was not severed from its historical roots and proximity to Jesus, the primary authority of the early church. Mool makes a similar claim, uh, but focuses instead on the necessity for a text to have an apostolic anchor rather than on the anchor itself. Uh, quote, if not actually written by one of the twelve, 
um, a gospel to confine my uh, inquiry for the moment to this category must at least have some kind of apostolic implicate, uh, impr- imprimatur. It must be shown to come from uh, some close associate of an apostle, if possible, with the apostle's express commission, unquote. It is reasonable to view the now dubious attribution of Hebrews um, to Paul as motivated, perhaps, um, by this very consideration rather than making a good faith claim, uh, a good faith historical claim, that it's having met all of the other criteria that it was able to, uh, association with Paul was able to tick off the last box without um, upsetting potentially um, the different criteria, but they may not well have um, operated that, that strictly. Mead draws out an important implication uh, from the fact that anonymous New Testament books were accepted as canonical um, within the earliest Christian community, despite there not being uh, authoritative traditions about their origins. Quote, we must never forget that many of the deliberations regarding uh, the authenticity and canonicity of many New Testament canonical and apocryphal pseudepigrapha took place long after their origins were forgotten. Uh, and their usage or lack of it had been established by the church, unquote. So if apostolicity was really as significant a criteria for the earliest church, as many today would claim, the absence of robust origin traditions undermines such thinking. Uh, as Clark concludes, to make apostolic authorship the foremost criteria criterion for canonicity and reciprocally, to question a work's canonical status based upon authorship alone, pseudonymous or otherwise, is to invoke a standard not used exclusively or even consistently by the early church. It would be truer to history to view the early church as more flexible in the canon-making process. Um, it is appropriate then to look more stringently upon the issue of, uh, is it, excuse me, is it appropriate then to look more stringently upon the issue of authorship than did the early church or to adopt the spirit of freedom seen in the church, unquote. And I would ask you to, to keep that question in mind as we'll return to it um, later on. Second, edifying, meaning uh, in uh, the conflation of ca- uh, Catholicity and use. Uh, so, I've combined them to highlight the idea in terms of the, the positive impact rather than just simply objective usage within the, the life and ministry of the early church. CFD Mool, while acknowledging the importance of establishing a work's apostolic origins, notes that the perceived ministry value within the community was a significant consideration, particularly for books that had long been in use. Quote, um, the original apostolic content was clearly a primary demand, but it was not always possible to test this as rigorously as might have been desired. And alongside came the additional test of usage. Um, Had the book proved its worth? Had it survived the critical sense of Christian tradition? For it is possible Uh, For it is possible that certain writings had already asserted themselves as eminently useful and sound before evidence of apostolic contact was discovered. In some few instances, it may even be that uh, the latter was a post hoc realization. But in such cases, the communis census fidelium had already been so soundly informed by authentic tradition uh, that its own imprimatur had uh, was in fact sufficient. Unquote. So in this sense, edification was ostensibly enough uh, enough of a consideration to render questions of apostolicity either less salient or perhaps even moot in certain situations. Uh, MacDonald comments in his essay or his uh, presentation last night that before there was a Bible, there was a church. Um, This speaks to the grassroots role played by the body of believers in shaping the canon or recognizing the canon um, that we have received. Clark fleshes this out in saying the following. Before the issue of a New Testament canon became paramount, the majority of the works that were 
later included in the canon, were already deemed important to the formation of the church's faith and were therefore in use. Of interest here is the fact that the community of faith, rather than the church authorities, were responsible for this process. What they determined to be edifying and useful later found a place in the canon. Church authorities only authorized and sanctioned what had already been in use. Unquote. The current nearly singular occupation with apostolic authorship for determining a, a work's um, authoritative value within the church obscures a complex yet rich canonical heritage that might well aid us in settling matters today just as it did for the early church. But again, we'll return to this in our conclusion. Uh, orthodox. I'm just, uh, this is the also ran category because I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, um, note to be, uh, to be made. I, just a quick quote from uh, Mool. Uh, as a corollary to ap apostolicity itself, constituting another criterion um, was, no, no, was no genuinely apostolic gospel could contain an interpretation of the incarnation contrary to that uh, orthodoxy, which, however difficult to define exactly, undeniably long to belong to the communis sensus fidelium uh, of these early decades, despite the great range of differences. Uh, so to summarize, um, it is clear that a variety of criteria were weighed in determining the value of a given work for the church, including apostolicity, antiquity, Catholicity, use, and orthodoxy. The failure of the church to apply these factors more systematically has understandably led some to question their value in understanding how early believers calculated um, the often competing values. Um, However, the variation becomes more understandable as we recognize the force as we recognize the forces driving them, which is what we'll turn to in the next section. So, how are we to understand the earliest uh, earliest Christianity's diverse application of canonical criteria? And the answer is conflict, uh, whether it's Marcion, whether it's uh, Gnosticism. Uh, the Donatists, uh, or, um, we have um, forces that were taking, essentially uh, refining what was accepted as, uh, or understood as acceptable understandings, and showing the deficiencies, the holes, the lack of precision, and the need for, for shoring those things up. Um, theologians are criticized for their tendency to whitewash the messiness of history in the process of systematizing the early church's teaching. But a former colleague of mine, a specialist in Trinitarian th theology, disproved uh, such a claim, at least in, in his case. Paraphrasing, he explained to me that what we think of as theology is most often forged in the crucible of controversy rather than in times of peace. In other words, had it not been for the heresies threatening the early church, and the ecumenical councils they spawned, the creeds that we rely upon to clarify orthodox belief would likely not have come about, or at least not until much later. Edward Lytton captures, uh, captures well how external challenges can force the refinement of ideas that were previously deemed sound. In some instances, the results uh, were from flawed thinking that needed to be corrected. However, Lytton focuses on the failure to account for an omission or a gap that comes to light as a result of the conflict. So I'm, I know there is a special place in hell for people who have long slides, but this is in old enough English. Um, so I, I will post it to, to read along. It was inevitable that in the process of time, attempts should be made to systematize and arrange the materials furnished partly by Scripture and partly by the implicit faith of the church. And this necessarily in the, lang in the current language and under the influence of the philosophy of the age. And this scientific action was materially promoted by the appearance of successive heresies. Each, as it grew to a head, called forth in opposition all the resources of argument from whatever quarter which the church could summon to her aid. And no Christian truth emerged from the conflict same in its mode of expression, in its established connection with other truths, 
as it descended into the arena, a legitimate development, um, not of new truths from the old, but of the mode of exposition of the old was coeval with Christianity and is inseparable from the idea of a living body like the church. So stated differently, the external pressures of heresy forced the church to address issues that had hitherto um, been uh, not been recognized as a vulnerability. So a modern analogy, how many of your churches 30 years ago had a policy on same-sex marriage or gender identity? Um, Probably you didn't. Did that mean you supported it or, or any number of other things? It's just, no, it hadn't been an issue, and you didn't know about that until the thing arose. And essentially, we could extend this policy to most of the New Testament books. You know, had there not been the controversy in Galatia or in Corinth or any of these other areas, we may, I'm not saying that, you know, trying to second guess about things, but the, the point is, it's important to recognize the role that controversy played. And if the controversy started later, that would account for why we don't have much discussion of canon until later. It's, it's an inferential argument, but I think it's, it's significant. Um, so Mool similarly recognizes uh, heresy as a driving force for refinement. Um, if we ask what criteria the church consciously applied to test the authenticity of its writings, we shall find that um, they are criteria dictated by controversy with heretics or disbelievers. Um, so the question is, how might going retro uh, help the modern church move forward? Recall the question posed earlier by Clark. Um, it is... Is it appropriate then to look more stringently upon the issue of authorship than did the early church or to adopt the spirit of freedom seen in the church? It is important that we acknowledge that the increased scrutiny upon authorship derives from the modern enlightenment uh, approaches. So talking about our modern, modern interest, it derives from uh, modern enlightenment approaches to historical backgrounds and the corresponding reaction to these in historical, grammatical, literal approaches. The scholarly debates will inevitably continue, but it is important that a path be cleared for the church to functionally transfer the question of biblical authority um, back, in my view, to the community process of canonization from historical conclusions that can be drawn, uh, drawn about authorship. Um, knowing that's messy, knowing that that's going to be, uh, you know, earth-shattering for some people, but I, I, that would be the, the course of action that I would be recommending, uh, or at least opening for discussion. So to conclude, um, as we saw from the, 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 the GIF, don't wait for a scholarly consensus. I was assuming we were speaking to pastors, um, but, but there, you know, I, I've heard many, many times, well, I'm just going to wait till it's sorted out. I, 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 I think that would be a long wait. It would be like saying, I'm going to wait for the Democrats and Republicans to come to a consensus about the 2020 presidential election. Um, second, apostolicity was important, but it was not, it demonstrably was not a deal breaker. Um, association with an apostle was certainly an important value, no question, but it could be overridden by the book's widespread use and edifying value within the Christian community. Books without a strongly attested authorial tradition, such as Hebrews, were likely associated with an apostle for conciliatory reasons to meet all of the benchmarks. Third, um, canonical shortlists derived from the community's usage um, and in terms of what was valued, what was found edifying. And I think that criteria could still resonate today in terms of our uh, praxis within the different believing communities. Um, so canonization is determined by the community, not the historically demonstrable author. As Clark summarizes, the community and not the prophetically inspired individual is the focus of canon formation, as he said, but I would say recognition. Um, fourth, application of canonical criteria varied according to contextual needs. So, um, 
Dr. McDonald made extensive reference to saying apostolicity was key in the context of heresy. And I think it was the easiest way to sever, you know, both the automatic authority assigned by the name, but also antiquity. And, you know, so that was an easy go-to thing. And so I I would say, looking at Lytton's quote, that they grabbed the tool that best fit um, the threat and that would best address it. Um, not saying that everything was done even you know above board and even handedly, but just talking objectively. Um, and CFD Mould makes a similar point. If we ask what criteria the church consciously applied to the uh, to test the authenticity of its writings, uh, we shall find that they are criteria dictated by controversy with heretics and disbelievers. The most obvious was um, apostolicity. And then finally, the shift um, shift the modern authoritative spotlight back to the dynamic canonical criteria from authorship alone. Um, I don't expect that historians will be satisfied with such a recommendation, but that's fine. The historical questions are legitimate academic questions and not necessarily a matter of faith or the effect uh, of, of authority with the authority of the text within believing communities. Um, and, and should we go in this direction, we would certainly need to reconceptualize some understandings of authorial intent and the connection back to um, an apostolic author if that is not the case. Uh, but that does not seem to be how the early, uh, early church necessarily understood them. Um, rather, it will require that more nuanced and more humble claims be made in this arena, and I would say uh, more truthy ones, uh, to TJ's point, um, and that we embrace that. So I see great benefit in revivifying the early church's canonical calculus uh, within our modern context, in that today's church faces similar efforts to undermine confidence in the Bible's authority, forgetting the trials and paths through which our received tradition uh, came into being relegates us to reinventing the wheel when it comes to canonical authority and and quite frankly the emerging wheel uh, that we see in the disputed Paulines uh, as a microcosm um, that are built around the hub of apostolic authorship seem very wobbly. Thank you. We've got a few minutes here for questions. Okay. I appreciate your uh, your talk, Dr. Rungy, very much. I think you bring up a lot of very important points for us to think about, especially in light of some of the other papers that have already been, uh, you know, circulating. Uh, I think of Elizabeth uh, Schusler Fiorenza, even though we would agree to disagree on many points, but I think she's right in in, in one thing, and she's very focused on the responsibility, you know, to deal with the challenge that Paul sets forth. And of course, she's looking at you know, the seven letters, but, but I think in a more general sense, we can look at what Paul's saying, you know, uh, to whatever, we've, we have a very diverse crowd here, a very yes. broad yeah. spectrum of traditions, which I think is good and helpful in talking about this. But you know, as, you know, I, I pre-ordered the Oxford uh, Handbook of Pauline Studies, as many of you probably have, and edited by Matthew Novitson, um, and, and I know that, you know, it deals with a lot of very important concepts, concepts we've been talking about at detail here. But one thing it doesn't talk about, and I just previewed, you know, the, uh, the table of contents, it does not deal with your, your point about edification and, and Fiorenza's point about responsibility. And what are the practical implications, especially with the paucity of professorships and more and more divinity school students from all these universities, regardless of what they believe, ending up in terms of their career in local churches. And so I think that in many cases in, in church history, you did not have so much this great goal fix between the academy and the church that we see today. And so I guess my point is more of an observation, but you can add some points of your own uh, critique uh, as you will. Uh, I, I think there has been a gulf, and it, I mean, I suppose if, if we think about biblical literacy, we can say, I mean, there's, there's a gulf. I think people have more access to information, but I, I think there's been a significant gulf previously, you know, uh, that people were just as blindsided in the, the late 1800s when Darwin came out. So I, I, I in, in many respects, the pastors or vicars are the gatekeepers for information for many of the folks in their congregation. Some may find out about it. We have Bart Ehrman, and he can go on Stephen Colbert report, you know, and, and see the interview. But um, 
I guess I would still see a golf, but I, I'm not saying I coined the the edifying thing, but I mean it was clearly in the descriptions in in you know in, in Lee's work and in others that that's what they were talking about. But the term is use, and it sounds generic and it's it's objective, which makes it scholarly. But it I'm not saying it misses the point, but I wanted to draw out a point specifically in terms of the value to the community. And if if we go back to those kinds of criteria, I think we can not move past some of these things, but it it, it just changes the calculus for us today, in 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 not necessarily having to uh, just blindly accept what was was given to us by the early church, uh, and from a dogmatic standpoint, but to be able to rest in things that nothing's nothing's changed. So the the original metaphor. Do we want to move the goalpost and adjudicate things on the basis of establishing historicity or, or not? And and my preference would be the or not. Yeah. We have time for one more question and then we'll uh, reset the table and get our panelists to the full up front. Please, I, please. I, was, uh, I really like the word edifying and it's very close to what Jim Sanders uh, Old Testament uh, professor uh, uh, termed applicability. Okay. And then Thank you. once applicability uh, was set in, then you have more canon, uh, a much stronger and fixed tradition. Okay. And then uh, to continue that, one, once that became fixed, then hermeneutics became a major issue for continuing the viability and the value of those texts that were earlier so cited. But Thank you so much for your paper. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>